God is, of course, yes, the God of history, of all history. He is concerned with all nations, not only Israel. But his involvement with other nations doesn't extend merely to their subjugation. If need be, or rather, if Israel deserves, then God will raise up another nation against her. So the final chapter in Amos begins by proclaiming this idea of utter destruction. I will slay them all, God says, and not one of them shall survive. Wherever they hide, under the earth, in the heavens, at the bottom of the sea, God's going to haul them out and he's going to slay them. And what about the covenant? Isn't it a, a guarantee of, of privilege or safety? Again, for Amos, its primary function is to bind the nation in a code of conduct, and violations of that code are going to be severely punished. So in chapter 9, verses 7 to 8, Amos makes the startling claim that in God's eyes, Israel is really no different from the rest of the nations. He elevated her, he can also lower her. To me, O Israelites, you are just like the Ethiopians. True, I brought Israel up from the land of Egypt, but also the Philistines from Kaftor and the Arameans from Kir. Behold, the Lord God has his eye upon the sinful kingdom, and I will wipe it off the face of the earth. These are harsh, harsh words. And you also have to remember that Amos was living in a time of relative peace and prosperity, about 750. National confidence is riding high. The people of Israel were pretty convinced that God was with them. They weren't in any real imminent or obvious danger. And Amos was convinced that despite this external appearance of health, the nation was diseased. They were guilty of social crimes and unfaithfulness to their covenantal obligations. And so, he says, they're headed down this path of destruction. And perhaps because of the optimism of the time, Amos had to emphasize this message of doom because his, his book is a pretty depressing book. Later prophets who are speaking in a different historical setting, in a more desperate historical setting, will often speak words of much more comfort and hope. But Amos doesn't do this. He does indicate that his purpose is the reformation or the reorientation of the nation. He wants to awaken Israel to the fact that change is needed. Amos 5, verses 14 and 15, Seek good and not evil, that you may live, and that the Lord, the God of hosts, may truly be with you, as you think. Right now you think he's with you. He's not. Change, right? So that he will truly be with you. Hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. Perhaps the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. The perhaps is important, and it's very indicative of Amos's fatalism. This is very much a fatalistic book. The overriding theme of Amos' message is that punishment is inevitable. It's pretty much inevitable. And this is one of the reasons that most scholars believe that the final verses of the book, verses like halfway through 8 down to 15, are a later edition by an editor 